Good morning and welcome to worship. It is a delight to come together in this way, um, to come and worship in God's house together. Even though you might be sitting in the living room or at the kitchen table or wherever it is that you're watching from, we are still coming together in God's house. And so welcome to worship. Just a couple of announcements as we are preparing and moving into fall. Some things are starting to change and starting to happen. And so I just want to share some things with you this morning. First off, next Sunday, September 6th, is going to be called Installation Sunday. Yes, we are going to be installing Pastor Eric Schrerian here at this place. They are here, yep. They're here and they're doing the quarantine, which they're just about done. On Monday, Eric will be in the church and hitting the ground running and uh, fulfilling the ministries that God places before us here. So, with that being said, next Sunday, so se September 6th, will be Installation Sunday, where we will install Pastor Eric here at Trinity. Um, bishop Bill Tesh, our bishop from the Northwestern Minnesota Synod, will preside over the worship service and uh, will install Pastor Eric. And then at the end of the service, Pastor Eric then takes over and then conducts the, the ending of the service. Now, that's next Sunday, but the actual installation is going to be happening Wednesday evening because we'll be doing it virtually, and so we'll be taping the installation service. And so I want you to lift him up in prayer on, on Wednesday, September 2nd at, 6, or at 5 p.m. is when the service will be and uh, we're going to conduct it here in this place, and we're going to videotape it, and then share that with you on Sunday, uh, September 6th, as Installation Sunday uh, for him. And so that will give you the opportunity to witness and to feel a part of his installation here. Now, does it mean he's not working? Oh, yes, he's working now, even from home. In this worship service this morning, we will do the opening worship service, and then when we come to the gospel and the children's message and the message uh, for you, uh, Pastor Eric will be bringing that to you uh, from his home. And so welcome, Eric, and your uh, ministry here and uh, beginning to, to share God's word and proclaim the gospel to everyone. Then after that, September 13th, our re-entry or our SMART committee has been meeting and kind of putting together. We are looking at doing a parking lot worship service on September 13th, which is Rally Sunday. And so we got some things that we're kind of putting together. So keep an ear and an eye open for some of that information that we're going to put out to you uh, for that Sunday, September 13th. With that being said, um, I just want to come to you with a special prayer request this morning. Um, Jeff and Lori Booth. Jeff has now traveled back to California to the City of Hope, the hospital where he is going to undergo treatment for the cancer that he has. My prayer request is on Tuesday, September 1st, that you hold Jeff and the entire family in prayer, Jeff will go into surgery on that day where they will remove portions of the tumor that they can remove and then prepare him for treatments uh, after that. And so I ask for you to please, please lift that family up in prayer. Um, they want prayers. They want you to know where they're at and, and how things are going and such. And we'll keep you posted um, with, with the progress and such that they make. But please hold them in prayer now this week as, as um, they undergo the surgery and then the beginning of the treatments and such for them. So with that being said, I want to lift up a special prayer right now before we begin this worship service for Jeff, for Lori, and for the entire Booth family. So let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, it is in times like these that we turn to you and to you knowing that in and through you, all things are possible. So, Father, now I ask that you be with Jeff, that you be with him. Give him that strength and that courage to know that you are present. 
And then, Father, I ask that you be with the doctors and the nurses that so diligently work in the, in the treatments and in the surgery to help Jeff. Be with the family. Be with Lori. Give her the peace of mind to know that you are present. And be with the entire family as they have been separated so many miles apart. Father, hear these prayers, these prayers of your people, as we lift them up to you. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen. So my friends, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. As we gather here in this place and in this way, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are opened and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God in the privacy of our own home with a moment of silence. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have left done undone and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, Gather Us In.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. We say these words together. O oh God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example. Point us to the path of obedience and give us strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our scripture readings for this 13th Sunday of Pentecost is coming from Jeremiah 15, verses 15 through 21. And I ask that you read this text on your own, Jeremiah 15, verses 15 through 21. And then our second reading for this 13th Sunday of Pentecost is coming from Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. And it reads like this. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. And bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. 
Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, then give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Be to God. Well, good morning. My name is Pastor Eric, and welcome to the Parsonage for our children's sermon this morning. Last week, we arrived to the state of Minnesota from Pennsylvania, and we traveled through states such as Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and then finally made our way to Minnesota. So because of that, we're just keeping our distance this week, but next week, the children's sermon will be from the sanctuary, and you may see myself and my children and my wife out and about throughout town next week. So I look forward to that. But today, I invite you to hear about what Jesus teaches us in the Gospel reading. He teaches us that we are to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. Now I have with me today a picture, or it's a cross, that someone gave me, or the congregation of St. Peter out in Washington State gave me. And I look at it from time to time, and my goal is to hang it up, and sometimes when we're not hanging a cross up in our office or somewhere in our homes, maybe you or your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, sometimes they wear crosses around their necks. And we have an assortment of crosses here in this room here this morning. And also as you drive by the church, you see crosses on the top of our church, on the sign of our church. There's three crosses on the sides of our church. And clearly, the cross defines as a central symbol of who we are as Christians. So when I encourage you, when you see a cross, such as this one or one at our church, to think about, again, what Jesus teaches us. To deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. And I encourage us to see it in this way. See it as a way of putting one's needs or someone else's needs in front of themselves. So putting someone else's needs first, and we're going to have a lot of opportunities to do that in the coming weeks as we start school. And what I mean by that is as everyone navigates, especially for the elementary students are going to be going to school wearing their masks. There's going to be some children such as mine that are going to need help figuring out where the cafeteria, where the gym is, and how to get outside for recess. And I even heard that potentially recess is going to be, you know, by class instead of by the whole grade in large groups of people. So we're going to have opportunities for students and teachers and adults alike to put the needs of others in front of ourselves by maybe taking the time to remind somebody to put on their mask or to you know, this is where you need to take time to help someone find the cafeteria, the library, the gym, or as you're outside playing in recess, let's take it, if you see a, maybe a younger student navigating away from their group that they're intended to play with, just take a moment, put their needs in front of your own and say, hey, I think you need to be with that other group because it's gonna take our entire community and our students and our teachers coming together and looking out for the needs of others so that we can come together and learn in a safe and healthy environment. 
So the next time you see a cross, think about it as an opportunity to help someone else, just like Jesus helped us, as he describes in his life, and how he describes his death on the cross, and then his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Well, I invite all of you at home to pray with me now. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I am so thankful for this opportunity to be able to engage with the children of this congregation digitally from our parsonage and speak to them at their homes or wherever they may be experiencing and participating in this worship video. I encourage all of us, children and adults alike, that when we see the cross, we see it as another symbol to put the needs of others by denying ourselves in front of our, our own so that we go through life helping each other. And in particular, with the upcoming school year, we may be able to help each other find our way through school, safely wear our masks, and participate in learning. It's going to take ourselves, our teachers, and other children to put the needs of others before ourselves and helping each other do this in a way that is meaningful and safe at the same time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 21 through 28. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I invite everyone to experience what Jesus told his disciples as if he is talking to Christians of all generations, including the early Christian church during the first century, which includes Peter and the other apostles, Christians living during the time of the Reformation initiated by Martin Luther during the 16th century, and all of us Christians living in Pelican Rapids, our surrounding community, and beyond who are navigating through life in the 21st century. It is helpful for each of us to recognize that the same Jesus who spoke to the disciples in the gospel story continues to communicate the following profound and difficult teaching to us now as Jesus proclaims. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. If your initial reaction when you hear this teaching from Jesus is to experience a feeling of discomfort as you begin to realize the inconvenience it would impose on your life if you took it seriously. You are not alone. 
It is clear that Peter's initial reaction to Jesus in this gospel story matches those same feelings when he, without hesitation, rebukes Jesus. It is not surprising because it, it is clear that Peter immediately realizes the significance of what Jesus is saying based on the context in which the disciples are living under Roman rule during the first century. The phrase, take up your cross, at that time could mean the following if you are a Christian living in this era. According to the theologian James Cone, the historical significance of the cross includes the cross was the method of execution for insurrectionists and rebels in the Roman Empire. The cross signified a public spectacle accompanied by torture and shame. And the cross was one of the most painful and humiliating deaths ever devised. To take up your cross during the first century was not an easy task, and quite frankly, based on these realities, required both a resilient belief in Jesus and trusting in Jesus' faithfulness to them in return. Living a life as a Christian during the first century clearly wasn't one full of comfort and convenience, and including denying the needs of oneself in order to follow Jesus. The disciples, despite these dangers, follow Jesus by teaching about his life, his death, and his resurrection, and proclaiming the good news about forgiveness of sin, healing, the importance of justice, and about faith that they were taught by the Son of God. Which, in case you are wondering, often resulted in them personally experiencing persecution and suffering. Now, our biblical ancestors I just described are not much different from our Reformation ancestors. During the 16th century, Christians such as Martin Luther and other church reformers during the Protestant Reformation continued to live into the same teaching of denying oneself, picking up their cross, and following Jesus. We have evidence of this in the simple action of those who took part in signing the Book of Concord, which comprises the confessions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. And I have with me here in this book this morning. By the way, I will affirm during my insulation service as Trinity's pastor next week that I will preach and teach in accordance with the Holy Scriptures, in addition to these same Lutheran confessions, we acknowledge as true witnesses and faithful expositions of the Word of God. Teachings in this book also include instructions we commonly use for confirmation where we teach about the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed. Now back to the signers and writers of the documents included in the Book of Concord. By affirming these affirming actions of placing their names in the preface to this book that Lutherans confess, they were potentially signing their own death warrants, as Dr. Kruger, the pastor and historian, teaches. I think it is fair to say these individuals and communities during the 16th century were clearly following Jesus' teaching by denying themselves and putting the needs of others before their own. Living a life as a Christian during the 16th century clearly wasn't one full of comfort and convenience, and concluded denying oneself in order to follow Jesus. I invite you to continue our journey nearly 500 years later to the 21st century. It's a story that includes me and how a leader in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America took time to deny themselves and follow Jesus. I was home on leave while I served in the active duty army during the summer of 2014. At the time, my wife and I only had Maggie, our oldest, and we were visiting my mom, dad, and family who lived in Pennsylvania. During these two short weeks, we were busy. Maggie was going to be baptized at my home congregation, 
We were spending time visiting my mom, who was living with pancreatic cancer at the time, and I was exploring the process in how to become a Lutheran pastor. I was guided by my home congregation senior pastor to call the Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod and to inquire about how to become an ordination candidate for ministry. He gave me the number to Fred Renegar, the chair of the candidacy committee. So I dialed his personal phone number and thought to myself, here we go. He answered the phone and after I said hello and introduced myself, he stated, who is this again? And why are you calling me directly? I simply said, because I was given your number and thought you were the right person to call. He then directed me to call our synod's, co synod's coordinator for vocations and leadership at the time, who explained to me about the process and the steps one needs to complete in order to enter into the candidacy. This person described how it typically takes several months to begin and an initial interview with the candidacy chair and director must occur first before anything else. So a younger me with a little bit more hair on the top of my head said, that's great. Can I meet with Fred Renegar and the candidacy director next week? Because I am on leave and I am not able to return to Pennsylvania for a long time. He answered my zeal by saying, to be honest, it's not likely you can schedule an interview that quickly. We have to verify the candidacy chair and director's schedule because one is a pastor and the other is a deacon. And I replied with, okay. So I went back to visiting my family and saying to my wife and myself, you know, I tried. What else can I do? And then very soon after, I received an email confirmation that I had an initial interview scheduled for the following week, the last week of my leave before I was to return back to North Carolina. I was blown away. Both the chair and director of the candidacy committee found time in their busy schedules for me. They embraced the inconvenience of a last minute interview despite their busy schedules and any discomfort this brought them in navigating outside of the normal candidacy process to conduct an interview with someone they knew nearly nothing about. The denial of themselves is clear, but they also went on to follow Jesus through their proclamation, teaching, and the guidance they instilled upon me during that meeting. Insight into ministry I still follow today. Just like our biblical and Reformation ancestors who denied themselves, these Christians in the 21st century also picked up their cross and followed Jesus. For that, I am grateful because it paved the way for me to later on accept the call to serve here at Trinity. Living a life as a Christian during the 21st century isn't meant to be full of comfort and convenience, as our gospel reading proclaims and still includes denying the needs of oneself in order to take up the cross and follow Jesus. The gospel stories about Jesus we hear each week are more than historical accounts. They are Jesus in the here and now being proclaimed to each one of us who are listening. However, we are called to do more than listen. We are called into action. So, I encourage all of us, including myself, to personally evaluate how we are each following the word of God spoken by Jesus to the disciples, the Protestant reformers, and to each of us hearing this message today that Jesus stated. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Amen.
Please stand if it's convenient for you. And let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as we say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, we pray for our community, and we pray for the world and all who are in need. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. Set the mind of your church on divine things. Grant us trust in you that we lose our lives for the sake of Christ and therefore discover joy in life through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world as you do. As the seasons change, pattern the rhythm of our lives in harmony with all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, you call us to live peaceably with all. Give us ears to hear one another, even those that we name as enemies. Fill all leaders with mercy and understanding that they advocate and genuinely care for those who are poor and most vulnerable in our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, you promise to deliver us. Give those who are suffering a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompanying those who are uncertain, raise the spirits of those who are despairing and heal the sick. And Father, we lift before you so many from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring reconciliation. Help us to overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God of all grace, you give us everlasting life. In love, we recall your holy ones who now live in your undying light. In our remembering, give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us pray the prayer that our Father has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Now, my friends, as we prepare to leave this place, to go out into the day and go out into the week, I ask that the road rise up to meet you, that the wind be always at your backs, that the sunshine warm upon your faces and the rains fall gentle upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. See you next Sunday.